And a warm welcome to Thelma FM. This is the broadcasting arm of the Living Memory Association. And this is Miles on Air with, today, delighted to have Andrew Grant back in the studio. Andrew was one of our first guests back in June uh, when he did a, a fantastic hour all about the First World War and Leith. And you're back today, Andrew, and what's, what's the subject today? Oh, today is looking at poetry, the Leith poets particularly, uh, but I'll tell you more as we go along. Yes, indeed. Them. So you've got quite a lot of uh, poems to read to us? Ah, uh, quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll have a little... If you don't get bored. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a little bit of music in between. Yeah. I should say we've got some lovely ni- uh, 78s from the First World War period, so you'll have to forgive the scratchiness, but it's atmospheric. So I'll hand you over to Andrew. Well, during my research about Leith in the First World War, I started uh, looking at the newspapers and I was intrigued when I came across various poems there. Now, the First World War was a great time for some poets. For instance, if I mention there's a corner of a foreign field that was written by Rupert Brooke, mm. uh, in Flanders Field, the poppies grow, again by John McRae, and one poet you might not know the name of is Robert Lawrence Binner, but for many of you, you'll have heard his work, which is one verse out of ten. They shall not grow old as we are left grow old, ah, yes, which yes. is to every uh, memorial service I've yeah. gone to. But these are all famous poets. There's things like Wilfred Owen and uh, uh, Rudyard Kipling and Secret Fassoon. People know of these, but not many know about the Leith poets. No, indeed. That, and, and and you've got a fine selection. A very fine selection. Uh, one poet in particular who lived in Leith and was quite prolific, he actually wrote a book of poems before the war, one during the war and one after the war. Uh, and But a lot of the poems he s- subscribed to the Leith Observer and it was very interesting to read these ones there, sometimes in the local vernacular, other times in good English. Right. Like that, uh, <laughs> or whatever. So I'm going to the f- uh, start off thinking about the First World War. Mm. When it started, there was a great deal of kerfuffle and recruitment. People were rushing to, some people were rushing to sign up, others weren't. But it soon sort of dried up, so you had posters all around the town, all around Leith, asking people to join up. So uh, this point... Wrestlerig by by pseudonym, mm. uh, J. B. Rowan was his name, and he wrote this one. It was in the newspaper, right. which nearly everybody in Leith bought. Mm. It's called The Lads of Leith. When history in days to come records the many deeds that in this world he circus done, with many a sere heart bleeds, old Leith will show a role of fame as gallant as the lave. For many a lad who's left his home has found a hero's grave. And many a name who bore the brunt against their treacherous foe may leave to tell he saw the front and helped to lay him low. The scene will never leave him. Sick thoughts impress the mind. This 20th century living hell or other fests mun bind. Your old old port in days long sign Stood many a month of stage, whose trusty sires drawn up in line proved horriers brave and liege, and ends again the lads of Leith gang for it where will, and Laura shall their brows breathe, and they show deeds that thrill. But still we've room for many mere, we've got to see this through, so come along and do your share and join the gallant crew. The mere the merrier they say. Say, up lad that's free, just show your cronies what today to gain the fame we see. Nay, hunker slidin's wanted now, just show the old leith spirit. There's no room, at least a few, that ever yet come near it. With I been kent as being game, or Ricky kens that wheel. So let's forever keep the name, and ain't more upward spiel. That was written in November 1914, just after, the, just after the war had begun a couple of uh, months. But another one in the same thing uh, about trying to get uh, people to join up mm. is, why don't you go? 
I mean, a lot of folk would be turning around and saying, why don't you go and join yeah. these people? Yeah. So this was one that's called, why don't you go? Mm. Out in the trenches our brave boys are falling, off fighting in water or sleeping in snow. Featherbed heroes, your country is calling. What are you waiting for? Why don't you go? Mothers are mourning, sisters are weeping. Heroes are dying, their face to the floor. Under dank sod, our loved ones are lying. More men are wanted there. Why don't you go? Men of our prawns, the empire is calling. Do not brave deeds set your bosom aglow. Throw down your spade and pick up your rifle. Shoulder your share of it. Why don't you go? See the boys marching neath liberty's banner. Mark the proud set of them row upon row. Have you no pride in the land that's bred you? What are you thinking of? Why don't you go? Will you seek safety while others are striving? Will you nobly look out in the show? Where is your manhood, young men of the homeland? Quick, get a hustle on. Why don't you go? That was written by a person called One of the Nuts. <laughs> now, I don't know who that is, but that came in. Not all of the poems, by the way, are um, got the, right, the writer's name in them, right. and a lot of them are, you'll find later on other things happen. And it's funny, isn't it? It's that mix of, of kind of gung-ho, but also it's mentioning, you know, people under the sod. and, and yeah. uh, So it's an odd mix of... But, yeah, there's a lot about people dying and things like that. It was in the papers, uh, and it was a little while before they started getting a roll of honour in the papers, yeah. uh, but it came. Anyway, one of the things I thought, what about the training of these people? Yeah. You know, go, uh, there was quite a bit written about it, but I didn't find any poems about it until I came across this one. Now, you'll have to excuse me, it's got 27 <laughs> verses. <laughs> right, but I'll not, I'll not record them no. all. I'll explain no. why when I stop no. at one point. Uh, so I've got a group that uh, ended up in the West Pier in Leith. Right. And they're called the West Pier Guard. And they called themselves the Lighthouse Keepers. Right? <laughs> so, well, when they, it's, it's a bit humorous in places, but yeah. it, it says, My name is Willie Queen, my boys, from Falkirk Toon I came. The reason I'm here, the new, I will very soon explain. Her war broke out, like other chaps. I went, all wreathed in smiles, and enlisted as a private into the sturdy wee Argyles. Now, the first day I got on my kilt, eh, man, I did feel proud. I donned it off to show it off, as every kilty should. <laughs> the lasses, they all stared at me. I heard them say, my fags. I wish I was going out with him. Just look at those bony wee legs. <laughs> I'd have fairly taken the place by storm when to me the captain came and says, here, now look here, Quiddy, you'll have to start to train. So he packed me off to Bedford with some others to get fit. But I found a mighty difference from working in the pit. <laughs> there they gave us bacon. <laughs> Sorry about that. There they gave us bayonet exercise. They gave us Swedish drill. We had muscles in our arms as big as Carlton Hill. Every week we had a route march. They trained us ever so far. And when we went sham fighting, we were covered o'er with glory. The training done, each mother's son, no doubt, looked just looked perfection. The orders came that we must prepare the next day for inspection. You should have seen us work that night. We did it all over time each cleaning up his equipment and making his buttons shine. I'll never forget that sight that day with my bayonet and my gun. I felt just like a peacock. I was dazzled in the sun. <laughs> Think I, if they would peace proclaim just now, they would be wiser. For if we go off to face the foe, then devil help the Kaiser. Then I heard a shout, Attention! And the colonel came in sight. As he approached, he said to me, who are you? You're looking quite bright. I said, Sir, I am Queenie. Oh, Queenie, you look grand. I'm very proud to meet you. Give a wee shake of your hand. <laughs> well, you should have heard the chaffing. Some said, Queenie, you're well in. You'll no be long a private. You'll soon get promotion soon. But as Burton said, the best laid plans do often go aglay. We bade that colonel at Turno over a while. And to Scotland we did high. We very soon hit Hoyt Toon, 
but there we could not rest, although sometimes we had down there were among the very best. Then our time came to shift again, this time in a hurry. They packed us off in express speed to Boney Edinburgh. <laughs> they marched us off to Pre Preston Street and placed us in a school, but our roving disposition it never seemed to cool. So one fine day new orders came, get armed to the teeth, but instead of going to France, they sent us to guard the docks at least. <laughs> We soon got under route to Reith, there was motors persevere. When we arrived, they sent us to the point of the Old West Pier. It's a fine place in the summer, we've proved that to the hilt, but goodness in winter time, it wasn't thinking nearly kilt. <laughs> but what's the use of grumbling? When they got out there, the hun, it's very hard for you on guard, but duty must be done. To settle here, I think, would be the best of common sense. They seem they'll keep me all the time on the home defence. The boys down here, I'm pleased to say, not one of them tax booze, and the man that tax us, lend us all, will be sure to lose. But amongst ourselves, we are arguing from morning till night, deep praising up this countryside till we nearly fight. As duties I won't disclose, the censor might complain and swear my blooming life away, I don't know his little game. But to leave the duties out of it, I'll try, though very hard, and describe the different characters who form the West Pier Guard. Now here I'm going to take a break, because there's about ten <laughs> verses all about the people that are actually in this West wow. Pier Guard. There's actually 15 of them, and there's a, a verse about each one of them Good and great. what he thinks of them. Right. Uh, I don't know if you saw this uh, before. They saw it before it went public. Well, I was going to say, yes, <laughs> so there could be uh, trouble, trouble ahead. Trouble ahead. <laughs> anyway, uh, the last two verses I'll read, though. Mm. Believe me, friends, with all these boys, we go through some great affairs. We all get squatted round the fire. We don't have any chairs. We bunt it till the surgeon comes, who's next for the guard, he'll shout. And voices three all at once say me, come on boys, then turn out. So now I've told you all the tale, listen, but if any nice wee lass, we'd like an introduction when the boys are out on the pass. <laughs> With a sample of her handiwork in shape of mitts or socks, she can drop a line at any time to the West Beard Guard Leith Docks. <laughs> I, I think it's actually, it takes a bit of humour, but it explains how some of the people are going all over the country. But uh, they had to guard the docks because they were being used all the time yeah. by ships and yeah. whatever. So, But not all of them were as lucky as that. No. Uh, in the West Pier docks. I mean, it must have been a cushy number. I would, them. yeah, it uh, does kind of indicate that. Yeah, yeah it? well, he's, he's had time to write all that. Yeah, but that's <laughs> true, yes. <laughs> I'll let you see 27 some, verses. I'll let you see the other verses some of the time. <laughs> but anyway, some of them actually had to, uh, once they got their training over, they were shipped overseas. And that's when it becomes a wee bit more, mm. less frivolous. Mm. And when they get the cross over the channel onto uh, mainland France, basically, they used to have to march to wherever they were going to be fighting. And this one's called Tommy on the March. Right. Uh, it explains a little bit, and then I'll explain a bit more about it as we go along. Mm. When the temperature's at 90 in the shade, or maybe more, and you're marching over a road that's thick with dust, with a rifle on your shoulder, and a pack that makes you sore. You do it not for love, but you must. You're maybe tired and hungry, and your throat is perched and dry, and each step takes another mile till a girl passes by. Then you wink your other aisle and twist your sunbaked face and put it into a great big smile. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not content with smiling. You must he let her hear you sing. So open wide your mouth and let it rip. Then your pals will join the chorus and you're happy as a king in peacetime when he's on a pleasure trip. It's the way with Tommy Atkins when he's up against it hard. He tries to laugh his troubles all away and he's usually successful, though he's sometimes badly scarred, but he'll fight and laugh until he's won the day. 
And that was uh, done on this 1917, that one. Mm. But it was by someone, what WGM, there's no... No other reference to it. Yeah, so So, (coughs) this seems a very good time to actually bring in probably one of the most well-known songs of the First World War. And as I explained, uh, this is from a 1914 78 record on the Winner label. Uh, and it's um, a long way to Tipperary, sung by Ted York, who I could find no reference to on the internet, incredibly. Um, but let's have a listen. One of the most famous songs of the First World War. Up to mighty London came an Irish man one day As the streets are paved with gold to everyone was Singing down to Piccadilly, Grand and Leicester Square. Till Paddy got excited, then he shouted to the bear. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. To the sweetest girl I know. fade out there because I think even that was getting just a a little bit um, scratchy and distorted but we've got to remember that this record is 105 years old which is absolutely phenomenal as I say I've no idea uh, who Ted York was I'm sure many people did versions of that before we begin again with the poems I was just going to ask you Andrew how you came about to actually gather these poems well I was doing research on the Leith and the First World War and I used the local newspapers quite a lot um, to get various stories, and I put mm. stories in inverted commas. Uh, some were true, some were not so true, some <laughs> were downright lies. Uh, but anyway, it was interesting doing that. And while I was going through all these newspapers, I did it from 1914 through to 1920, uh, while I was going through them, I saw initially there was one or two poems, and then in 1916, there seemed to be a bit more of a plethora of poetry coming in. And so I thought, OK, I'm writing all these stories, I might as well write the poems as well. So I went back to the beginning again and started, whenever there was a, a poem, what I did was photograph it in the newspaper, mm. take it home, uh, improve the quality of the print and enlarge it, and I'd retype it all out. So I've now got... Uh, a catalogue of almost 250 poems uh, f- from the First World War. A lot of them written by people from Leith themselves, right. uh, as you'll hear, and others may have been imported, and I put that in inverted right. commas, from other sources. Right. But they were all in the newspaper, and very, very interesting they were too. So I just started doing that as well as uh, the stories I was writing up about uh, what happened in, in the front or at sea or whatever, and I've got this catalogue, 250 now, and I've only got one copy of ha- one hard copy, though I've got the rest all on uh, the computer anyway. Uh, what well, amazes me, it's one actually, the quality is, is pretty good, isn't it? What you've read so far. Uh, well, they are, they're very good, and one or two, as you'll see 
quite emotive yeah. as well. Yeah. And that's the th- I mean, all right, I used that one as to lighten things up yes, as well. Yeah, yeah. As well as be informative how they went down to Bedford and into Hoyk and then we're, And that's yeah, the thing, it's yeah. the ordinary voice, isn't it? Yes. Very much. That was I can just see that as it being a, a guy sitting at night in the West Pier and just saying, Oh listen, what can I write about him? And, mm. and just doing that. So. Yeah. But some of them are really quite emotive and yeah. take a lot of thought when you read yeah. into them. Yeah, absolutely. So what's what's the next one? Well, as we uh, as I said, they went over and they marched up to the front. Not all the um, time they had there was spent at the front, um, but I'll come back to that as well. Um, but when they did go to the front, life wasn't too great for them. Mm. Um, Giving an example of that, there's a well, there was a private James Johnson who was in the first battalion of the Gordon Highlanders. He sent this poem I'm going to read now uh, to his mother, uh, Mrs. Robertson, who stayed at Six Mitchell Street in Leith. Yeah. Now, Private Johnson is only 19 years of age, but his brother, who's John Johnson, he's in the Sea Force, and he is also on active service. And their uh, stepfather, uh, another Sergeant W. Robertson, formerly the King's Own uh, Yorkshire Light Infantry, he's connected with the Mounted Police in France. Mm. Now, Private Johnson was employed as a dock elevator, whatever that is. I couldn't. Right. Do, uh, <laughs> I, but that's what he. Was, that's what his job was. He worked in the docks here. Yeah. So, this one is literally about the battlefront. And it's called The Charge of the Gordons at Hooge. Now, I don't know if I've got the right correct, correct term of that, but Hooge is about four kilometres away from Ypres, and the battlefront went back and forth across that area throughout the whole war. Mm. And he wrote this to his mother about what they were doing. On the 25th of September, the Gordons lay impatient for the signal to advance. And the Germans will remember the charge he made that day for a finer regiment never fought in France. On the morning of the battle, the cannons they did row, shrapnel dealt out death on every side. Such terrific cannonading was never heard before, it was as if the jaws of hell had opened wide. In the trenches, there we stood, drenched with our comrades' blood, while maddening cries from the wounded rent the air but the cordons we did stand, bravely waiting for the command to drive the wily Germans from their lair. Hark now, the signal comes, mince the booming of the guns. How welcome that glad signal with a cheer. Then we chased with glittering steel, see these Germans all do it to reel. We took the trenches from them ere we broke the day. We fred about their guiles and the gallant forty two, the Camerons and the Seafors have done brave deeds and all. But with the gallant Gordons there is none that we can vie, for fine they fight for Britain's right, they will fright and win or die. Now that was published in April uh, 1916 by Private mm. Johnson. Mm. On the 7th of May 1916, uh, Private Johnson was killed. Good God at the front, mm-hmm. is commemorated on the Arras Memorial, so he must have been in that area all the time. Yeah. It's, it's very uh, poignant, poignant, isn't it? Yeah, so that's someone writing a letter to his mother, and yes. next thing, as you'll see later, uh, getting the information that he had died. Yeah, yeah. Now, also, as well as going to the front, uh, Ypres and all that area, a lot of the forces took to the water, on the sea rather, right. uh, and by ships, and they all went to Gallipoli. Now, people will know in Leith particularly about what happened on the way to Gallipoli when the Gretna disaster happened. Mm. But I've purposely omitted to do any of the poems of that particular event. Uh, I'll come back when the, the celebrated, well, not the celebration, the commemoration yeah in May next year, yeah. if you'll have me. Oh, certainly, <laughs> certainly. But anyway, uh, this one, once you get the gist of this, you'll know it's a, you can feel it to music, right. and I could sing it, but I won't. <laughs> right? Well, it's about, uh, anyway, it's about where the old Gipolese sits down to the sea. Right. 
Now, Galilipopolis is a wonderful place where the lads in the trenches of who have to face. They never mumber, but smiled all through it all, for soon they expect Alibaba to fall. At least, when I asked them, that's what they told me, and Constantinople would have a great spee. But if the war lasts till doomsday, I think we'll still be where the old Gipoli reached down to the sea. The night we landed, I'll never forget. We came up from the beach with our clothes soaking wet. Though we were soaking right through to the skin, we got picks and shovels and dug ourselves in. We stayed in the rest camp till our clothes had dried, and then the charge on the 12th of July. I bet the old sticks made the turfs turn and flee for the old Gallipoli which sweeps down to the sea. We took several trenches before we could stop, for we rarely had Johnny Turk on the hop. When we saw our bare knees and tartan we wore, he cried, Allah, Allah, but that was no use, for the six were determined to take no excuse. So we gave them the bayonet, which meant R.I.P., where the old Gallipoli sweeps down to the sea. While up in the trenches were rumours we hear, it's enough to make... Uh, sorry, it's enough to make any mate take to the beer. They say that we are going home soon, but I believe there's a man in the moon. They say that in Glasgow they're waiting for us, and when we get back there will be such a fuss. But don't you believe it, we'll spend Hugmanay where the old Gallipoli sweeps down to the sea. We don't go potatoes or barley or wheat, we are I look on the lookout for something to eat. We're fed up with bully and biscuits and ham, and we're set of this sight a yon parapet jam. But give us fried eggs, onions, bacon and eggs, and a nice big fat chicken with five or six legs, and drink of some of that stuff that begins with a bee where the old Gallipoli sweeps down to the sea. And that was done by a young that was written down by a young bugler bugler by the name of Stokes and I've put no further information yes, on that's him. amazing isn't it yeah, but and people writing that and they're in the middle of fighting yeah, yeah. it's incredible and I think that kind of shows doesn't it in the language and actually the reality of it uh, yes and the beautiful. cynicism there's a lot of cynicism oh, in yeah. that it was really, really is a, you can feel the the tensions they're getting. Yeah, into it. yeah. Uh, because Gallipoli was anything but a, oh, yeah. a walk over. Yeah. In fact, there were so many people killed there, and well, I don't know if I can say it, but Churchill was to blame on that. Absolutely, yes. yeah. I think that's widely but, acknowledged but, uh, now. Isn't so, it? But anyway, the people when they were actually uh, at the front. They weren't always in the trenches fighting back and forth. They, they went in for a period and then they went back to a rest camp. Mm. Another group came up, relieved them, and it was just a, a continual amusement. So they got yes. maybe a week at the front and two weeks in rest and then yeah. back up. It went like that through whatever front they were on. Mm. Sometimes it wasn't a rest. Sometimes they were fighting in the um, rest areas as well. God. Now, after the... That when they were coming back, you can imagine after a week fighting, being getting shrapnel, mm. or whatever it was, machine gun fire and all that that was coming over the top of you. They would be glad to get back, but yeah. they, wasn't, they didn't walk back. Um, shall I say marching like they did to <laughs> a long way to Tipperary? No, right, because many of their comrades, no doubt, had been killed yeah. or whatever and back. Yeah. So. This poem, when I first wrote the next one I'm going to write to, I uh, speak to, um, I've, I got very emotional when I read this because mm. it was basically about these men coming back from the front. Now, this was written by um, a second lieutenant, R.W. Kerr. Right. Uh, he was a master at the Heath Academy. Oh. He, d he was originally he was educated at um, Barham Muir School, right. but he eventually got his entrance to Murray House, became a teacher and he was teaching and before he went off to the war and he went into the machine gun corps right. and uh, he became, as I say, a second lieutenant during that time. Mm. He came back and he was a 
my, a teacher at Bruton High School, so right. there's local connections, yeah. and then also was Leith Academy, and he became a journalist. He joined the Scotsman, and then he went to Liverpool and did at Liverpool newspapers. Okay. Um, he married a lady from uh, Abbey Moor, right. uh, and they settled down, but they were still, he, he survived the war, mm. uh, but when the Second World War broke out, his family all went back up to Avi Moore and he stayed on, went down to Liverpool and came back to Leith right. and stayed here. Right. And it was giving you a little background of yeah, this guy because yeah. I know about this. Yeah. <laughs> I felt a lot about him. And it him. is a tremendous poem. Yes. And his name is R.W. Kerr. Right? Right. And he sent this poem to Miss Meanie Ritchie, who recited it often in public, and to quote what it said in the paper, the lines are remarkable for their dramatic intensity, virile emotion, arresting language, and unconventional construction. They are lines that will live. Now, he actually wrote one book, and this poem was in it, mm. but it was in the newspaper first. Just, I always think poetry sometimes gives you a picture of what's yeah. actually happening, and that's what this does here. Absolutely. Have you seen the men come from the line? tottering, doddering, as if barat wine had drugged their very souls, their garments rent with holes and caked with mud and streaked with blood of others or their own, haggard, weary-limbed and chilled to the bone, trudging, aimless, hopeless on, with listless eyes, drawn faces, taut with awe. Have you seen the aimless go bowed down with muddy pack and muddy rifle slung on back and soaking overcoat, staring with eyes that note nothing but the mire quenched of every, every fire? Have you seen them when they come from the shell holes filled with scum of mud and blood and flesh and when there's nothing fresh like grass or trees or flowers and the numbing year like ours lag on, drag on, and the hopeless dawn brings naught but death and rain, the rain, a friend of pain, that scourges without end, and death, a smiling friend. Have you seen the men come from hell? If not, ah well, speak not with easy eloquence that seems like sense of martial glory, War's enabling story, war and its necessity, and do not rant, I pray, on war's magnificent nobility. Oh, if you've seen these men come from the line, well then you know it's peace that is divine. And if you've not seen the things I've sung, then let the silence bind your tongue, but make all wars to cease and work and work for everlasting peace. That was on the 10th of November, 1917. There is nothing yeah. glorious about that piece of writing, is it? No. It's, it's a real... It reminds me, actually, of the, the great war artists of that time, like Paul Nash and Neverson. Yes. As he says in there, it's all about the weariness, uh, the reality. The reality of, of it. Yeah. It? And see, well, as they say, with the blood and, and mud, and uh, it really uh, it gets me that point. Actually, yeah. whenever I, yeah. I read it, even just now, I was feeling a wee bit yeah. choked. Yes, I understand. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. but anyway, that, that's one of the things war was about at that time. It's, yeah. and it's, I don't think it's any different now. No. To, for whatever it is. No. But anyway, uh, there were other aspects of uh, least. Uh, and the war. Mm. Excuse me. For yes, no, of course, yeah. Uh, the, the Leith Hospital um, it treated over 5,000 people during, well, the casualties during the war. Right. Uh, not all of them were British or Scottish, for that matter. When Canada and um, the United States joined up, uh, they were treating people from those nations as well. But mm. from the records I've got up in the um, Loading Health Service archive, there was about 5,000 altogether. But 
also, a lot of the doctors and the nurses that were trained at the hospital, in Leith Hospital, mm. joined up with RAMC, the, the doctors, or some of the nurses, they went to Queen Alexandria's nursing corps and various other nursing uh, groups, of which I know two of them were actually killed in the First World War. Right. Only two are in the role of honour, which uh, seems a bit odd. Yes. Because I found other women that really done. But anyway, the doctors all went to join the RAMC, the Royal Army Medical Corps, and for a while the normal Tommy or background thought they were a bit of skiving, you know, the, the RAMC. Mm. They were always at the back while they were doing the frightening at the front. Mm. But this is one here where I, the soldier that wrote it uh, obviously changed his mind about them as we were going through. Right. So it's Apologies from the Infantry, it's called. <laughs> we called you the Linseed Lancers, you men of the RAMC. We looked on you as washouts the pets of old maids and their tea. We called you Polisha Dasses and said you were safe from the lead, kept back in the line of battle, just ducked up fellows in bed. R.A.M.C., yes, rob all my comrades. We thought that a wonderful skit. And run away, mother's coming. We also thought it could hit. Your work could be done by women. You may not to be in the fray. Not having good times as we thought of you, but our views are quite different today. Now it's well done, you linseed lancers, you chaps of the RAMC. You've worked harder than any department of the battalion or infantry. We've seen you go over the top, chaps, with Ali Moon on you play. You've not only done it in darkness, but you've done it in the light of day. We've seen you at the top of our trenches, mud up to your knees and wet through. You didn't get flustered or windy, but you did your work faithful and true. We know how your backs have been breaking, but many a life you saved. We've seen you around with your stretchers, as your lives for the wounded you've braved. So forgive us for what we called you. We are now sorry for what we have said. For we see with our eyes, that's believing, and nicknames we once called you are dead. Now we are proud of our stretcher bearers, you chaps of the RAMC. For you've shared all the dangers beside us, and with your kindness you've always been free. When they ask what you know of your fellows, well, tell them in blighty with pride that the RAMC stretcher bearers were the heroes on every side. Now that's written by somebody, just an infantryman. That's what they're So written. no name to name, that nothing whatsoever. At all. But it just shows you how looking at one aspect of the the war, like the RAMC, yeah. and there's lots of them. Then I've got a few tales about the RAMC as well. Yeah. Uh, a lot of them were trained and went, um, as I say, in Leith Hospital, and they went to Inverleith where they got, if you want, army training, uh, and. A lot of them went out. In fact, at a point, there were the sorry. In fact, at a point, Leith um, Hospital was getting a bit desperate for how lack of doctors really? and nurses. Now, if you read some of the history of it, right. but they managed to get through. And it did an awful lot of um, work actually for the injured that came actually yeah. on ships from when the the hospital ships came into Leith and taking them to there. But there was also the Eastern General Hospital, right. uh, where again there was doctors, and the Western General Hospital. All of these hospitals were actually um, taken over largely by injuries from people who were at the front. Right. And I mean, the, the, you know, these doctors and nurses would have been seeing injuries that they really hadn't encountered oh, they hadn't before. hadn't encountered before. I mean, some of the... I mean, you, you, I don't know if you've seen fit, uh, uh, pictures of those people that were injured, and they're quite gruesome, especially mm. those when they. But they, they, one good thing that came out of the First World War was actually about skin uh, replacement and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've seen the photographs of people who had facial injuries, which yeah. are, are really quite horrific, mm. but they actually rebuilt people's. 
faces. Yeah. Uh, and I, th I think the RAMC, as I said, they're underrated at the beginning, but really yeah. they got praised yeah. in the end. And it is, I think, what comes over from these poems is reality, isn't it? Oh, it is, the dawning it is. of reality. Yeah, that's what actually happens there in the front. Yeah, yeah. Now, if you're in the trenches, one of the things that you have to do mm. is actually go on sentry duty during the night or whenever, uh, when people are either dossing down or what, if they can get the chance to doss down. Yeah. And if you fell asleep... Uh, on sentry duty, it was a capital offence, mm -hmm. and quite a few people were, shall I say, shot at dawn because they'd fallen asleep or whatever uh, during the, um, their sentry duty. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, I could mention it now, but two Leith men were actually shot at dawn. Were they? Uh, for other one for, a, for an offence like that, another I mm. uh, won't go into them, but those two of them actually done too, and I, I, I'll, I'll come back to that uh, yeah. further on this afternoon. Yeah. But anyway, this is a story about somebody who is in the trench on sentry duty. Mm. Uh, it was again another leader, leader uh, Private T. Addison of the Ninth Battalion, Scottish Rifles, mm. who says. He's somewhere in France, as everyone <laughs> always used to say. And it sent this for a, the publication in the Observer. It was sent direct to the Observer. No. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't received. It was just about Christmas time. And it was, they got it a bit late to be put in the, the Christmas edition. Right. But it was on the New Year edition. Right. This one here, about Tommy uh, in the, the dugouts mm -hmm. and a dream that he had. <laughs> I'll come back to that, just yeah. you'll know, you understand the part in a moment. Poor Tommy in his cold dugout, his thoughts fly over the foam. He thinks of his dear wife and his little ones at home. And he wonders if they've lots to eat, these precious little kids. And memories make him sigh a lot and rub both his eyelids. But though he is on duty now, a faithful watch to keep, his head begins to nod. And then poor Tommy's off to sleep. He's back again in Scotland with his children by his side. His loving wife embraces him and kisses him with pride. He dreams of such a welcome and he is home on leave and everyone is happy now for this is Christmas Eve. They speak to him of Santa Claus and toys he's going to bring and Tommy shakes his head and laughs and says he does not know but Santa Claus is sure to come if off to bed they go. The children they are soon in bed. He kisses them one by one. He smiles into his wife's dear eyes and knows there will be fun. They fill the stockings up and each has a toy. When the kiddies rise next day, they'll all dance with joy. But he must be very careful, for some eyes are very bright. They are full of curiosity and they won't sleep much tonight. By and by the kids succumb to the overpowering sleep, though Tommy is not sure of them and has many an anxious peep. And when at last he's satisfied, his wimp brings out the toys, she has dolls for the girls and horses for the boys. And Tommy fills the stockings up with oranges and sweets. He feels as happy as a kid, his heart so joyful beats. He stands and views the stockings, with the toys all hanging near, and then he hears the sergeant's voice barking in his ear. Wake up now, my lad, the sweat breaks on his bow. Remember in during the trenches, not in the doss house now. And Tommy jumped to his post and looked around at the boys. They said, I'm glad I went to sleep, the kiddies got their toys. Oh my goodness, that is just full of pathos, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And, and I think we should take a break there. Yeah. Uh, it's quite an emotional. Uh, we've got another winner um, record here. And again, this is very, uh, this is contemporary with the First World War. This is The Laddies Who Fought and Won. And again, you'll have to forgive, it is rather scratchy. Sun's on the sea, they all 